Hi, this is Dr. Toby, your host on Health and Wellness. Thank you for joining us. We're going to have a great time with Dr. Monda Munger. Dr. Munger is a graduate of the Tugula College. She has a bachelor's in business administration, got a master's in public health from the Jackson State University, and then a PhD in leadership development in education, also from Jackson State University. She's a former chief operating officer of the Brothers Keeper organization that spearheaded since 1999 the caretaking of positive HIV individuals in the state of Mississippi. She's now working at the University of Mississippi Medical Center as the um, assistant professor in population health. And she's been a recipient of several grants, numbering more than $7 million. She's going to talk about her, her, her faith, her future, and her fortune, how God has brought her from a blue-collar background where her parents were less than educated to the point where she and her sister are now multiple degree holders. You do not want to miss her story. Don't forget, Jesus is Lord. God bless you. wellness thank you for joining us we've been talking with dr mada monga she's a public health advocate she's a educator she's a sister she's a daughter and uh, she's here to share her story as a population health expert she's an assistant professor at the university of mississippi medical center and she's made her mark in the world of public health primarily with working with people who are underrepresented or who have health care disparities particularly in the HIV STD field. So we're privileged and honored to have her on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so for much for having me. Yeah, we love having you. She told us about her journey through Tougaloo, through Jackson State, told us about her auntie who had HIV, her great-grandmother who mentored her in the Bible, and she's poured out her heart. And uh, we're going to continue on that journey today. Um, there's a little bit of concern about... Um, people who are African-American in the scientific field, they feel that there's a dearth of them, there's a, there's a attrition rate, there's few people, and maybe, just maybe your industry, the public health, population health field is maybe male, Caucasian dominated. Mm -hmm. Is there a challenge in that area for a black American female? Is there, have you ever felt intimidated, ostracized? Have you ever felt overlooked? Is that some concern? Because there's some young girls who want to be like you, Absolutely. and they're wondering, will I be able to make my mark in that male-dominated industry? Um, I would say initially, yes. Uh, that that was actually the push to get the PhD, uh, mm -hmm. because I had the experiences and I had the knowledge, but in order to be fully recognized, the degree was necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the contribution that I'm personally making is I'm working to mentor more African-American uh, young women to say that this is a field that you can come into and it's a wide open field. Mm -hmm. It's a field that you can find passion and purpose in. And uh, so I would like to say that I'm, I'm changing the mark myself, but absolutely, I, I can say there were many, many, many times that I was, I was if not the only one of very, very few African-American women sitting in a room uh, making decisions around a population that looks very much like me. Right. Mm -hmm. So in medicine, we call it cultural competence. That's yes. 
having people who look like you treating you. Absolutely. They've said in the past, I don't know if the studies have changed, but they've said people basically have better outcomes when they have better health care, uh, cultural competence in place. Absolutely. You know, whether it's because of psychology or mm -hmm. just, I don't know, what relationships. So obviously we know that in the HIV world, there's a high percentage of African Americans. Mm -hmm. But you and I know that if you go to the average infectious disease clinic, mm -hmm. I know for a reality that we did not have the first infectious disease African American trained fellow in the University of Mississippi till probably 2010. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was Brian Temple. Okay, I know Dr. Oluwatade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oluwatade. Yes, so Dr. He, he Oluwatade. Told me he was the first, but I don't he know may have been the first. Mm -hmm. So Oluwatade and uh, then Brian Temple came in, but Brian Temple didn't stay here. Oh really? No, he he went up the East Coast. Um, but I do re recall right. Dr. Alou. So he told me he was the first, mm -hmm. and I think he was like 2010 or something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that tells you yeah. we've been treating yep. the African American population, and yep. you know, we didn't have a representation. So does does that does you think the cultural competence matters? Do you think maybe for example, I'll give you an example: clinical trials. They said African Americans hardly make up 10 percent of the clinical Absolutely. trials. Absolutely, you do a lot of grants. So how, why do you think they don't show up when they're doing? trials on HIV drugs, hepatitis drugs that maybe mm -hmm. African Americans are the most vulnerable for. Right. right. You know, so what is Well I think it's I think it's a twofold. Uh one, they don't see persons that look like them, number mm -hmm. number one. Especially for younger generations. So I've done focus groups and I've actually talked to African American communities and what's uh what's astounding is the older generation, uh, because of internalized racism actually believe that a white doctor is a better provider than a black doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was they, they were conditioned to believe that a, a Caucasian doctor knew better, knew more, had more opportunities for more information mm -hmm. than a African American or a black doctor. Uh, while younger uh, mm -hmm. people uh, actually seek to find uh, providers that look more like them. Um, so that, that is one thing. Uh, the having someone that looks like you. But I think the second piece that we don't talk about enough is the medical mistrust in the African-American community. Uh, the uh, I remind people that the Tuskegee experiment only wow. ended in 1973. And so that was three years before I was born. Mm. So my, my family, my parents, my aunts, my uncles are still very much aware of the Tuskegee okay. experiment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, things like that, um, where, where people like Fannie Lou Hamer and many, many other African American women were, were given hysterectomies without their knowledge. And so those are the reasons why uh, the African American community is, is quite apprehensive uh, to, to taking part in a clinical trial. Uh, I think we saw a rebirth of these misnomers and, and misconceptions with uh, with the onset of COVID, mm. because so many people believe that they're going to put something in me, they're going right. to do this, but it wasn't until um, black churches and black owned and run community based organizations came to the forefront that actually switched the trajectory of mm -hmm. Mississippi, because we ended up having one of the highest populations of African Americans vaccinated than any other state oh, in the wow. country. But it was it was only because entities that that black people trusted said, okay, so we're going to come out front and we're going to help with this. Yeah. yeah. So it, it it matters. It matters. It absolutely it, matters. It, 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 matters. it absolutely so matters. Ignoring it is not going to help. It's it's time to engage. Absolutely. And see how we can make a difference. Absolutely. And so. if we're going to address the issues around HIV and STIs in the black community, we're going to need those same entities to come to the mm -hmm. forefront. To, to discuss, to educate, uh, inform, and give out resources. Mm -hmm. So it, it's going to have to start from the communities that, that black people trust. So that's what the faith-based connection is. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and for many um, faith leaders, they, they feel like there's this fine line, right? If I, if I talk about HIV, if I talk about these things, then that means I must be condoning uh, premarital sex or extramarital sex. And, and that's not the truth. What we want to do is make sure that sin is sin. People go, you know, whether you eat too much or, or have premarital sex, sin is sin. 
God sees it all the same. Mm -hmm. But what we have to do is create um, ways that people are educated and informed, informed. From, right. from resources and places that they trust. It'll be, it'll be a game changer if, and I hate to be so plain, if a HIV positive African American pastor yep. spoke up. Absolutely. It would be a game changer. You know. It would be a game changer. We could but we actually. But we don't nope. talk about that. Nope. Nope. Even though we know we have those mm -hmm. in the in the mm -hmm. church. I mean, mm -hmm. we have people who yep. are HIV positive. Yep. yep. We we would we could eradicate. I, I I tell people that HIV is the easiest, hardest disease in the world to get, because I can't get HIV by touching you. Mm -hmm. I can't get HIV by hugging you. I can't get HIV by being in the same room with you. And so it's it's not that it's so easily transmitted. Mm -hmm. But it, it is often transmitted by something that people do just naturally. And um, if pastors and faith leaders stepped up and addressed HIV the same way they have done things in the past, COVID, for example. Right. COVID was proof that if if the community steps up in a way mm -hmm. uh, that, that we could eradicate it. So, like, go get tested. Go get tested. That's it. Simple. Go create space. You're not telling anybody to go have sex. Just go, go get, get tested. Go get tested. Right. Go get because tested. there's more than one way to get it. You Absolutely. can get it from IV drugs, from blood transfusion. Yep. So don't just say, okay, I, I haven't had sex in 20. Right. You know, it could be other. Yep. So, it, yep. so just like in Africa, I don't know if you know this, but there are laws that before you get married, you check your sickle cell genotype. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Okay. You cannot get married to another person until both of you know your genotype. Mm. And that... Obviously, if both of you are carriers, or one is a sickle cell, one is a carrier, I don't think it will rule out the marriage, but obviously you now know the repercussions yep. mm -hmm. of going mm -hmm. forward. Right, and the likelihood you know. that, that any children that come forth mm -hmm. will be, yeah, will have sickle so, cell. Yeah. So I think maybe we should start talking about that in the church. I, I agree. <laughs> I, I agree wholeheartedly. And and talk about it in a way of not a, of condemning, condemnation but talk about it in a way that you want your parishioners to be healthy mm -hmm. you want them to be well not just spiritually but you you want them to be well as a whole person right mm -hmm. now if you go to church and start talking stds condoms mm -hmm. you know how i mean it's going to be a mm -hmm. there's a, there are people who are going to be concerned that it's not the appropriate mm -hmm. audience so how do you dr Munga, couch your presentation to a church faith-based audience? The, the, the first thing I, I want people to know and, to, and that I acknowledge is that we have all sinned and fallen short. Mm -hmm. And so the presumption, um, God knew we were sin, which is why Jesus came in the first place, right? So we, we know that we are a, a sinful people. We're going to make mistakes. And so the, the goal is not to judge people for their mishaps. Right. Um, but what I just said, it is to provide people the resources and education. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe a church has to hand out condoms. But at least tell people where they can go to get them. Where they can go get them. Right. right? So you, you don't necessarily have to go against the bylaws or the foundation of the faith institution. Mm. But you can create resources for people to pick up privately uh, if you have a health ministry, have a full health ministry, mm. not just about blood pressure and diabetes or cancer, but around all pieces all of pieces. health. And sexual health is a part of health. Major and part. so to ensure that, that we are treating the whole person mm -hmm. spiritually, physically, emotionally, absolutely it's the church's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we can do it in a way that is that does not go against the foundation of the church. I agree totally. And that's something that the church needs to, like they did in COVID, come together Absolutely. and and, and speak together Absolutely. as a united Bring force. experts in mm -hmm. to have conversations. Make sure that your leadership team is knowledgeable mm -hmm. and answer any questions or concerns, and then we can move forward with creating a plan that's going to help the parishioners. Tell us about My Brother's Keeper. You worked there for a few years. Yeah. yeah. What was the, I don't know the story, but obviously you, you helped make a difference. Yeah. And yeah, I know yeah. you have an NGO now, so you can also talk about that. Sure, Let's sure. Let's know sure. what do they do. So community-based they... organizations, I believe, for public health, population health, health in general, are vital. Um, I had the privilege of working for a uh, very, very strong community-based organization, My Brother's Keeper, 
who has been around since around 1999, um, founded by Dr. Mark Cologne, and the vision has truly been recognized by Dr. June Gibson. Who is Mark Cologne? Mark Cologne was a um, was a uh, was a public health practitioner who advocated in the early 1990s for more funding to go towards um, my, the minorities who were being impacted with HIV to uh, same gender loving men, uh, to African Americans. Um, he and another group of people were very instrumental in uh, HRSA actually starting to create a pot for minorities impacted mm. by HIV. Was he half African American? He was African American, uh, yes. Was he at JSU? Uh, he was at JSU. He okay. was at JSU. He was at the State Health Department. Oh, wow. And so um, he started My Brother's Keeper, and Dr. Jim Gibson, uh, who was under his tutelage, uh, actually took it to the next level by creating a clinical arm to a community-based organization. So I had the privilege of, of working with them for about four years and still have a very, very close relationship with them. So uh, amazing organization, amazing work. Um, uh, really one of the very first fully, I would say, sexual health clinics in the state of Mississippi where you could come and get very um, open, free, and inclusive care regardless of your sexual identity or gender, your gender identity or sexual orientation. So they sponsor the open arms? Yes. Clinic? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's yes. why I keep getting the name. Yes. So, right. so Open Arms and My Brother's Keeper are essentially the same place. Mm -hmm. Open Arms is just the clinical side, and My Brother's Keeper is the community the side. Community side. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Absolutely. So, great, great work. Um, and I had the opportunity to to not only create uh, programming that was impactful in Mississippi, but uh, in the Southern region as a whole. And so, uh, so like my patient in this town. She did. She didn't have insurance. Yes. She was HIV positive. Now, there are people watching who may be positive and they don't know the. I don't want to say the benefits, but how can a community-based organization help someone who has HIV and doesn't want to be? They don't want to bring it to the public. Oh, awareness. absolutely, absolutely. So what 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 community-based organizations can do is is guide you to the resources that you need. Uh, for instance, there's a program called ADAP, the AIDS Drug and Assistance Program, that will actually pay for not only HIV medications, but any other medications related to a person who's living with HIV. Um, the, their, their housing programs, uh, their food programs. So there are all of these different things that could help persons living with HIV to, to have a whole and help, happy life. Um, it, despite of their their HIV status, and there's a Congress Act, I think. The Ryan White, the Ryan, the Ryan White, White Care Act, and Ryan White Ca Care. Uh, Care Act. Actually, what it does is so Ryan White Care Act actually is five parts. So there's Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D, and Part F. Um, a, B, and C are totally around health care. Um, part B generally goes to the health department. Um, and Part C goes to clinics that are providing mm -hmm. care. But this CARE Act basically ensures that uh, people who are uninsured or underinsured who need health and services around HIV are, are pretty much taken care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll, just, I'll just tell you a story. I mean, just this is a, this is a young man in my, in my clinic, and one came to me and, you know, he, I just tested him randomly, yeah. positive. And he's a pastor, and he doesn't want anybody to know. So he refused to go to the clinic in the medical mall. Yep. Because he said, people know me. Yep. If yep. I go there. They're going to know. Mm -hmm. So he wants me to write the prescription. He wants me to do everything. So I'm curious, aren't there opportunities for people like that not to be publicly identified, going through the doors of open arms? Right, right, right. And places right. they can do. Well, I think the beauty that in, in the, the spaces that Open Arms has created, honestly, Open Arms does primary care, Open Arms does uh, family planning. Um, that So they do a merit of services. Mm. I think a lot of that is internalized stigma, is, is me knowing if I walk through that door, this is what it means. Mm -hmm. But uh, Crossroads Clinics, all of these clinics actually provide multiple, multiple services. Yeah. And so this presumption, uh, I don't think that that's always on the clinic or on the particular um, uh, clinical setting. Uh, some of that is internalized stigma. 
and that is that is that own stigma of I know when I walk through this door because I know right. when I've seen other people what I thought about them, yeah. right? So so we're dealing with a little, little bit of our internal stuff when that right. happens, I think. And when I'm educating patients, I educate them that internalized stigma is a real thing. What would you say to this patient who has it but doesn't want to tell his partner? I mean, if he's in a MSM relationship. Yeah, so, so I, and I've had the privilege of, of actually coaching people through this. Um, but I ask people to put themselves in that situation. Would you want to know? Would you want to know if the person that you said you loved, would you want to know if the person who said they loved you, would you want to know if the person who laid next to you every night, um, wouldn't you want to know if they were someone living with HIV? And it doesn't mean that that life is it's that life is over. You know that if you're living and thriving, and so mm -hmm. to to give that person the same courtesy that that you would want. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So it's just you know, I mean, and denial comes in at times. Yeah. I had a patient the other day who was told by Dr. Mina he had it, and he said at treatment. Then he came back ten years later and said. But Dr. Mina told me I was cured. By this time, he had warts, he had mm -hmm. um, PCP, he had the mm -hmm. you know the end stage AIDS mm -hmm. defining diseases, and so the question was: Did Dr. Mina tell him he was cured or he was he was virally suppressed? So virally I want you to just suppressed. add some education to that because people hear these words, yeah, and they hear virally suppressed and they think I'm cured. Yeah. And now he's obviously not cured and yeah. is in a very yeah. terrible state. I had to yeah. call the health department to get him some uh, around white access yeah. and medication access because yeah. he had no insurance. Yeah. And he was in his mid forties. Yeah. Yeah. You know. There there there's the presumption. I, I think that providers, one of the things whenever I'm educating providers, um, is to ensure that you understand the your patient's level of understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, never use words like cure. Uh, when explaining viral suppression, and for anyone who doesn't know, um, the markers for HIV are really around your CD4 and viral load. Uh, CD4 is essentially, in lay terms, it's your immune system. We want those numbers to be as high as possible. Uh, the viral load is the amount of virus in the body, and of course we want that number to be as low as possible. And so um, if a provider says that you're virally suppressed, it simply means that there's just a small amount of virus there, right? Now, we only get to the point of viral suppression if clients are taking their meds as prescribed, right? That's not skipping medication, taking it daily, and we can get it. We can get the virus down to a very, very minuscule amount. Here's the thing, that does not mean cure. That means that the virus is so under control that it's not multiplying mm -hmm. at the rate that it would be without the medication. Now, the moment that medications are stopped or halted, or even if there are interruptions in medications, missing, uh, missing doses, not taking medication on time, the moment that there's an inter interruption, you could quickly see the viral load go back up, and that's what we don't want. Uh, so it's not cured. It is simply virally suppressed, right. small amount of the virus in the body. And that's, you know, people have come up with this transplant and several medicines yeah. for cure. But at the moment, yes. in 2024, we don't have There is a no cure. cure. There is no cure. We're hoping for a cure, yes. but there is not a cure. The there medicines cure. can bring you, like Magic Johnson, I know he's public about Absolutely. it, to the point where you're virally suppressed. Uh, Absolutely, and well. You know, and and well. living a healthy and life. And living a healthy life. You know. And here's the beauty about viral suppression. Research has shown us that um, with viral suppression, it also reduces the likelihood you will transmit it to someone else. So that's what's right? called the U equals U. That's the U equals U. Uh, Un undetectable, which is small amount of viral, mm -hmm. uh, equals untransmittable, untransmittable, means it's very, very, very unlikely that if you are virally suppressed, AKA undetectable, that you will actually transmit the virus to someone else. And so there is beauty um, in being, uh, as a matter of fact, there are four pillars to the end of the epidemic. Uh, one was prevention, that's knowing that HIV PrEP is there, and PrEP is actually medication that you could take uh, while you're HIV negative to ensure that you don't acquire HIV. 
Uh, but the next piece was that was, was treatment. Oh. And we know if we get people treated and get them virally suppressed, we can ensure that they don't transmit it to someone else. In this town, I had a patient. She, she had a partner. I think it was not her husband, but she saw me for three years. Mm -hmm. And this partner had HIV. And I, that was the first time I heard of the word PrEP. Mm. She came to me and said, I heard there's a medication yeah. that you can take yeah. if your partner has HIV. And I was like, oh, my goodness. So I looked it up, and I gave her Truvada. Yep. Now there's Discovy as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. But do you, do you know how many doctors don't know about that? Absolutely. And um, this woman died before her HIV-positive partner. Wow. I don't think she died. She, did, she never contracted HIV, but she obviously had some other health, health conditions. Uh -huh. Just to show you that HIV is actually as well treated as diabetes, better. hypertension. Better. It's as it's, you can better. live a totally normal life. Yeah, better. You know, it's actually better. In many cases, the medications are so good. It is one pill once a day. People um, who are HIV and other other HIV positive and otherwise healthy, they're only taking one medication a day, compared to many people with high blood pressure and diabetes. We're taking multiple medications to try and, and now stay there's the shot. And now there is there's the shot. There's a cabanuva you take once every two weeks or once yep. a month. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a shot for prevention, too. There is also a, a, a prep, prep. Uh, a prep shot, yes. Is that once a month or something? I'm that sure. is once a month. Yeah. Uh, it, the, recommend, the recommendation is that, uh, that people take it every four weeks uh, as on time uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, because it, it, it can uh, start to create an opportunity to acquire HIV if you're not on track with taking it. So the same way you would take the medication daily, you would take the medication on time for weeks. So apart. the challenge is, if you don't think you can take pills every day, yes. get the shot. Get the shot. Yep. They used to say you can only get the shot in the clinic, but I don't know if they've changed that now. Right now, it's still, it's still, in the clinic. Yeah, it's still yeah. that you have to come in for a doctor's appointment. Uh, in order to get my it, patients the show. love it. Yeah. Oh it's my a great god, tool. they love it. They get. It's a great tool. One of my patients said, "Take all my pills to your next mission trip. Give it to somebody in Africa yes. who doesn't, who needs it." I who was need, like, "Oh yeah, wow." Yeah, it's yeah. She loves the show. It's a it's a game changer. <laughs> it is a game changer. The 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 truth of the matter is, prep uh, HIV prep as a whole was approved in 2012, but African Americans um, have less access in the sense that no one's talking to them. That prep is an option, and so we we're we're steadily working on prep uptake, uh, especially among Black women. We are working to get a prep uptake as a. Um, and we're going to talk about this, your advocacy for women, because I think it's something we don't talk a lot about. So yes. we're going to next topic. She's going to talk about her advocacy for women, African American women. We talk a little bit about men a little bit, but I guess I haven't had a guest who talked so much about the African American women's so owner. And, you know, unfortunately, people who talk about that get labeled, you know, feminists. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's why we don't see as much. So on the next show, Dr. Monk is going to hone in on this advocacy for the African-American female. And I know you'll see something you've never seen before and maybe why she's so passionate about it. Looking forward to you joining us. Don't forget, Jesus is Lord. God bless you. Amen. <music>